Okay. Hi, thanks for listening to Bowties in Business. I'm your host, Tim Kubiak, and today we're joined by Neil Stanton, and we are going to talk about what it takes to build and scale businesses. So Neil's worked in and around high tech for years. He's been a personal friend for over 25 years. Neil, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Tim. And it's kind of scary when you say 25 years because I don't feel like uh, I'm any older than 30. So we must have met when we were five, we, I would assume. We started hustling gear in preschool. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I think you're, you're right about that. <laughs> so we both came out of basically the aftermarket telecom business. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> Yeah, back in the uh, the days of rip and roar, if you remember, prior it was really prior to internet, so it was uh, all relationship driven. But yeah, that's I'd yeah. say that's probably where we started. I think you were yeah. at CCA, and I was at Phonex. You were at Phonex, I was at CCA. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it still seems like yesterday. It does. It does. So since then, you've started a whole bunch of companies, including an integrator or a VAR in that voice space. So. You know, I thought we could start a lot of our listeners are small business owners. And you started with a couple of partners, basically in a small space. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah, it was actually a couple of them. Uh, if you remember, it was flagship even before Consult Edge. But yeah, I was in UC. God, I guess uh, after leaving PhoneX and maybe just even touching on it a little bit, it was one of those cases where, you know, you start to do the math, you're paid on straight commission and you say, well, I get 25% of the profit. If I start my own company and do one quarter of the business, I make the same money. So it was a uh, you know, pretty pretty easy leap at the time. But yeah, it was uh, myself and uh, Frank, if you remember Frank. I remember Frank. First company, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so you know, one of the things that is interesting is a lot of people when we talk on the show is they've transitioned careers. And in many ways, you're the perfect example of that, right? You went from your selling, to your own business, to you stay in technology, but you continue to evolve. And one of the things that I think is the scariest for me personally is you look back and you see some guys that are still essentially in the same place, doing the same job, hoping to hold on for five more years. You've taken a different path. What led you there? Uh, well, I think what you just said is part of that. When you you look back now and you see the same people, not just in the, you know, again, that same place, but it's literally the same company complaining about the same things they complained about 20 years ago. I didn't want that to be me. My my progression had always been driven by, you know, sort of like a shark. You always want to keep swimming, right? So I was always looking at, you know, what's the next step? And, and to be fair, some of it happened by accident. Right? You just kind of fall into it. But I think, you, you know, you say accident, but you got to be smart enough to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you. So it went from literally, you know, telecom startups to going to work for a larger company, leaving to start another company, and then getting into a network of uh, private equity and uh, a couple of people I knew that were sat on a lot of boards. And, you know, the last several years has really been more around that, you know, let's call it early stage or turnaround type business. But you know, being put in by other people other than me having to go ahead and establish it. So you kind of get that that same benefit without all of that upfront. But yeah, it's definitely been a progression. Yeah. And so you've gone from telecom to security, essentially, right? Well, so yeah, telecom to security now, and then into software, back to security, and now software again. Yep. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the things I think you know, you, I woke up one day and I looked around and all of my friends were executives or business owners. I don't know if you had that moment, but I'm like, yeah, the, those of us that are still standing, so to speak, that that's where we've all ended up. Right. Um, but there was a stage, if you remember, so it was after Bradford, um, we had gone through, you know, it, it wasn't, I would say a rough year, it was an interesting year because the, the company ended up eventually being sold to Fortinet, you know, great organization, great people. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot of, you know, every day was, are we, we working on financing? What are we going to do? Right. How, how's this going to work? You know, great customers, the rest, but, you know, after that, I decided to go carry the bag again. So if you remember, I actually went, um, so yes, all the, all my friends are still senior execs running companies. And, you know, I literally decided that I'm just going to go and spend some time. I'll find the right company. I want to establish myself in a territory, just go make some money and be left alone for a while. You, you should have seen the face on, on, you know, when I was interviewing, because again, all network driven. So it wasn't, you know, hitting the one ads or, or does anybody even know what a one ad is anymore, but going through the, 
the uh, the job listings. It was going to people I knew that had opportunities. We're looking for somebody with my experience, but explaining to them that. So let me understand this. You're going from you know a global head of sales role to wanting to carry a bag. Why? And the answer was simple. I just want to be left alone, make some money for a while. But yeah, it it, it didn't take long to realize that. Um, and, I, and I actually use uh, the, the head of sales for the company made a comment. John Brandis said one day, he goes, "Look, Neil, you know you're kind of selfish." When it's all said and done, because you're really selfish. Because you really, you're good at your job. You're good at what you do, but you're you're probably going to be better when you're making other people better as well. And he goes, "So, hey, kudos to you because you, you can make money, but I think you're missing the calling." And that's that. It's true. I I, can, I don't think I want to go back to doing individual, at least not short term. Yeah. But and I'm sure you see the same thing. You know, taking yourself and what you know and being able to help others do that. That that's something that you know. Once you get to that point, have that skill, you don't want to lose it again. You want to stay there. Yeah, yeah, you know. And it's funny because I always look, and I I've had this conversation with coaches and friends and partners and everything. And it is, I I am not the guy. I would much rather help twelve people be successful at this point, you yeah. know, and not have a life than make the same money and just carry the bag. <laughs> well, I don't know about the not having a life, but you know, there is something to be said for that. You know, I, interesting. We just had this conversation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a few of our guys were asking us for something and they were, you know, saying, well, you know, we have to go do that. I said, time out. I said, what do you mean we? So I, I, just to kind of set it to, I'm in a unique situation with our company that I am still running the global sales team, but I'm also co-CEO. So I basically get to scream at myself every month when we went where the numbers are. But you know, the, the conversation was around something that had to be done. And I said, guys, you, you're missing the point. I said, you know, you're reporting to me with all this information, but, but I work for you. All the things that you're talking about right now that you need, I have to clear the roadblocks for you. So th this is not a case of you coming, you know, as, you know, I can't get it done. Help me help you. So it kind of goes back to that too, where you're talking about being able to teach and learn. And, and I like that better. It's one of the reasons I, I said before, I gravitated to startups and turnarounds or late stage, you shouldn't even just say turnarounds, late stage as well, because they need something. You know, I make it really clear with the people I work with, if we get this thing running smooth and it's great, I'm not your guy long-term, I'm just not. And it's not that I don't wanna stay, you'll be better served with a caretaker until you need something strategic. And we saw that with Consult Edge. I mean, I started the company, right? You know, and if you remember, I would say the first three years, which were you know the growth years, the hardest years, Oh my God, I, I love it. I loved every second of it. I loved every win. I loved every hire. I mean, it was, you know, every new deal that we made with a, a vendor was fantastic. But then I had a great management team in place. Right? We, we hit steady state. Ah, that was, those are a couple for me personally, there were you no know, great years financially or else, but rough years in terms of just feeling like you were still making the difference that you could. And then we had 2008 was what the, uh, as we call it, the mortgage crisis hit and we had to make changes and do things differently. And it's like, well, thank God I'm here because this is what I'm good at. So we're really able to, to help maneuver the business. But, you know, it, that's the fun part. And I, I know you're like that as well. You like to tinker and drive and make change. Yeah. I, I've spent a lot of money in therapy to learn that I should never run anything that works. I should yeah. only run broken and growing things because but otherwise I will break it to rebuild it. And that's not always a bad thing either. Uh, I mean, there's things that we, well, look, I'll, I'll look at where we are now at Ramp. Um, so myself and Anthony, my co-CEO, who, who's also a CFO, we basically changed this company. We, we ramped, revamped all the products, right? We changed how we go to market. Uh, we've built up our relationships. You know, our, our key vendor is Microsoft. We've gotten much deeper with them and we actually built the product around what they were asking for. So we're really seeing the benefits of it now with all the, the customers as they start to return to office. You know, for, I, maybe real quick, just to talk about what we do. I think you know, but everybody else may not. But what we do is provide software that helps companies that are doing large streaming events reduce the bandwidth impact. So when you think about what that means, it, it's significant. If you're not careful and you start running these, you know, big Teams events or any other type of streaming media event, you can quickly crush the bandwidth and bring down all the other applications as well. So we alleviate that anywhere up to 99.9%. So think about that in terms of, you know, all the productivity, that's what we do. But, you know, in order to do that, which was really rough during COVID because nobody was in the office, no, no bandwidth impact. For us, it was an opportunity to take a, let's call it a, a breath, look at the products and really 
set it up to come out of this or moving into this hybrid workplace, you know, we're poised to lead the industry. So, you know, a lot of that too, it's, it was that break it, all that tinkering, all the, the rejigging of the product. I, I love that. I mean, every, you know, while it was still a little bit rough on the business, it was a blast and, and now we're seeing the benefit. Yeah, it, it is the most fun, right? And you, you hear the stories about the gamblers or the traders or everybody who gets that high from doing that one amazing deal. And in short, we've built a career of rebuilding things because we get that high from it. You know, that's a great, I've never really thought about it that way, but it, it is true. It, it's a feeling that, and I'm glad you're you know, we're talking to entrepreneurs. You know you're, if you're an entrepreneur or not, an entrepreneur or not because of that feeling. If you don't have that addiction to that feeling, I'm telling you it isn't for you. You're going to have a hard time because, you know, I talked earlier about celebrating those wins. Those wins in the beginning are so celebrated because they are seldom and, and they're, they take a long time to get that momentum. You know, it's not, as they say, it's not for the faint of heart, but I couldn't have it any other way. I, I'd rather, and I know this sounds kind of odd, but I enjoyed suffering through those first six months, like I said, then, then doing a steady state deal because, you know, what am I contributing? I, you know, I know I'm still contributing, but I don't feel like I'm making the same impact or difference that you do early stage. Yeah. And, and that's why I sit on startups and I, you know, I sit on boards, I do other things. It's not because it's making me rich, right? It's because it feeds that part of you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Even some mentoring. Uh, so I actually have been working with, I believe not kids coming out of college. I've done a few uh, stints of helping them, but really interesting. I'm helping a company right now that works in the SAP world that you know, we'll talk with their head of sales, you know, a couple of times a week. He's an old friend and we'll, We'll go through some strategy sessions and things that they can do to, you know, reach out to the market to keep the company. Even interestingly enough, it's some of the dynamics having not been in a partnership before or a, you know, having or having other people that have say in the business. It's the mental aspect. You have to learn to sometimes shut up. You have to learn when to sit back, when to allow other people to fail, even though you know, because that's. Really, at the end of the day, sometimes it's the only way people learn. So you have to figure that piece out. But to that point, yeah, I mean, I'm still looking to get some more formal boards and things like that just because of that. I, I enjoy that piece of it. So I think that goes back to you said earlier. It, it's the the education, the training. It, it's it's being helpful. I mean, you know, how many more years do you want to do this, right? So you want to be as helpful as you can for as long as you can. I, and I know I'll go back to consulting at some point, maybe full time, but not yet. Not yet. I still enjoy this. Yeah, and it's literally why I've held my holding company was to continue to be able to, you know, do that, do some consulting, non-competitive and things like that, because it's just part of keeping the game sharp. Oh, definitely. And funny enough, and I'll go back, this is uh, I'm probably about 18 years ago, 15, 18 years ago. So I had a couple of mentors that I work with um, on a regular basis, you know, one being Rob Scott, obviously, mm -hmm. who you know, I, he's, uh, I would say like an uncle, because if I said like, you know, a father at age, we'd be angry. But, you know, Rob <laughs> is, has been such an influence on me because he's always given advice and I've actually worked for him. Uh, he's on our board here at, at Ramp, but it was also Kent Spafford. And I remember having dinner with Kent one night uh, and we were talking about um, just, just what we were seeing in Consult Edge, some of the issues I was having going through it. And he was the CEO at the time of One Call Medical. And, you know, we're kind of just running through some ideas. I said, no, Ken, why do you do this? I'm just curious. I mean, other than we get along really well, you're a great guy. You know, why, why do you do this? Because we get together for dinners as often as we could. And he goes, because I learn as much from you as you do from me. And, you know, I, I was a 30 year old guy and, you know, Kent had been, you know, senior leader and for how long I was kind of shocked to hear that now that I am a, a bit older and more, it's true. You know, we, we, look at things differently. We've been doing this a long time. There's, there's kids that actually just so kids. There are people in other organizations that have different points of view. So I find when we're doing these types of, uh, of discussions, I pick up as much or more than they do, or at least that's how I feel at coming out of it. I'm sure you see the same thing. Absolutely. I, I've watched young people walk into businesses and go, oh, this. And you're like, wow, never would have looked at it that way. That's brilliant. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Well, they, they talked about, you know, women in business this has been the, the big push. And I don't mean that it should ever have to have been a push. But if you think about uh, all these uh, thoughts about, you know, the way the mind thinks, the way people work differently. When I first heard that, I was kind of like, 
to me, that was common sense. I, I know that we don't always think alike. and It's a different point of view. So yeah. I'm shocked that it took some kind of a movement for people to wake up and realize that men, women, doesn't matter. Everybody's got different opinions and thoughts. I've always surrounded myself with the right people, regardless of, of all of that. But again, kind of going to where we work, you try to be as diverse as you can too. So that's been another, I would say that's something where I've evolved. I mean, I really actually look for the perspective more now than I did. I'm sure you're getting that probably, Tim, and, and same thing. You're you're finding more opinions. So it's not just where I'm kind of going with that. It's not just kids. It, it could be anything. You know, it's even geographical. You know, you talk to Europe. I mean, it's constantly on the phone with, you know, APAC and uh, EMEA. They look at things very different than we do here in the U.S. Yeah, they do. You know, and it's funny you talk about Europe. I was on the phone with a friend of mine that's a Brit, right? And they're like, well, you just do this. It's really simple. I'm like, mm, you can't do that in America, right? You can't just unplug for a month. That's not how our holidays work. Yeah, you must be talking about August. <laughs> so on the whole country. We were actually talking about the fact that I work well into pub time. But yeah, August is the is was the follow-on topic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this morning I was on with Italy. And that's what we were talking about, you know, for Agosto. Everybody's going to be off for, for August. And I said, oh, it's a good time to come visit. Except I don't know if you can you fly there yet. I have no idea. <laughs> that, so you can fly there. They cannot fly here. Okay, but can you come back without quarantining, or do I have to quarantine when I'm there? So you may have to. Yeah. So you may have to test to come back. But yeah, so it's really interesting that that you talk about global travel in this world. Like we can't, we can go pretty much anywhere now, but no one can come here, and well, unless you yeah. unless you have an executive or a um, investor's visa. You know, our lead investor at, at Ramp is uh, Canadian. Canadian says, I guess he's dual citizen. So he goes back and forth between yep. Canada and Boston. But I, I was saying he's required to quarantine yeah. when he comes back in. And if you're not Canadian, I mean, good luck getting in. Yeah, you can't. It, it, literally, I have an uncle who's lived six months a year in Quebec for since the 60s. And he's not been back since 20, fall 2019 when he left because he doesn't go up till the ice melts, so to speak. Have you had a trip yet? You, uh, you... I, went to, I went to Austin last week and I got some of my leadership team together and it was interesting all being in a room again. Um, and it was also interesting because it's the first time I met them in person, right? No, so was... I, I, I've had people reporting to me that I'm on, the, on video with, like we're going here, you know, 10 hours a day and you meet them in person and it's like, eh, yeah, it's like I've known you forever. But there's a lot of that. I mean, uh, my nephew works for a company. He's been in their M&A group and he's never met anybody in the company. He's yeah. been remote since he started working for him. So, yeah. you know, for me, I, I, you know me, you know how I am. I need to know everybody's face, their family, their, their yeah. wife's name. I mean, I, know, I need to know everything about them. This, this for me is, is killing me. So it's, uh, it's time. I, I've just got my first trip. We're booking to Minnesota. But, uh, you know, for a conference coming up, but I need to get out. I need to be on the road. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. For, like, the first eight months, I'm like, yeah, I don't care if I ever get on a plane again. And then I'm like, mm, yeah, maybe once in a while. And, like, yesterday somebody called and said, can you be in Orange County at this time? Yeah, okay. Uh, can I fly earlier? Can we get there soon? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I went to dinner. It was last Saturday evening. We went in to see my son. He lives uh, in New York. So we went out there, and I, I felt like I was in a different country. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the streets were packed. There was people all over the place. The restaurants were all over. I mean, it was just, I wasn't ready for it. And as much as I thought I'm ready, like, I mean, I've not been locked in the house. I'm not, you know, a, a recluse, but I was not ready. Yeah, but, but in a way you are, because I think you, you may have gone through what I did, which was I was somewhere for 30 years. And then suddenly I was in a green room seven days a week. The gym was closed. Yoga was closed. Right. And then I had was working on projects where I couldn't be out in public. And, and um, because of the nature of what they did, I, I couldn't even take the risk if I wanted to ethically. And so when you go back out, it's a little overwhelming. Yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, for me, it was, you know, I mean, I don't, you put me in a room of people, I'm a happy guy, I can talk and have a good time. But I'm looking around and not that I'm uncomfortable, it wasn't even that I was even uncomfortable. So it's not like I was afraid to be around the people. Or, it just didn't seem right. It, it just seemed odd. Yeah. yeah. And I'm looking for the first flight. I can't wait to get back on and, you know, see how it feels to be sitting with people in an enclosed area. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you, flying in a mask is weird. 
Well, I didn't do the train. I'll tell you. So we were going to take the train in, you know, this up from uh, the path. We drove yeah. in instead. But uh, I don't know if I was ready for the train. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I'm ever ready for the train. That well, that's kind of <laughs> that one in particular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a, do you remember my friend Steve that I used to work with in New York? Yeah. Um, so he, and it was funny because the office in New York, he would never take the train. He took a car everywhere he went. And I, and I said, well, you, you were prima donna. You can't take a, a train. He said, no, I make enough money. I'll take a car everywhere. I prefer it to then being around all these people on the train. He used to say, I don't know who knows who has what. And everything. You know, you kind of look back and say, huh, was Steve onto something, right? He was, yeah. he was never sick. But yeah, who knows? They get a little wacky. Yeah, you you know it's funny though. You look at that. The happiest place for me in a long time was when I cleared security and headed to the airline club because it felt normal, yep. right? And when I get in the back of a car with somebody else driving that doesn't know me, right? That you know I'm not I'm not dad in the back seat. They gave up the front seat. I'm just that guy. And you can work and you do everything and it feels completely natural again. But it is natural. You don't realize how often you did it. And my joke, I took, I can close my eyes and drive to Newark airport. Yeah. I, I had that routine down where, I mean, I knew I can get to the airport, get to the valet, get onto the, to the, uh, yeah. um, the tram. I'll be at my terminal. And I could get there with five minutes before boarding and walk on. Yep. I mean, I had it down pat and it never failed. Well, I actually once it failed, and that was a long story, but I was able to constantly get to the airport. It was great. Now I'm like, all right, what's it going to be like? What's the, you know, going through all the, uh, every, everything through the side? Do I have to do a test? Do I have, what has to happen? I don't even know. I'm not prepared. Yeah. Kind of for me, I've, I've lost all of that routine. Yeah. But you're right. To your point, Tim, it's kind of scary. Your routine is being in an airport terminal, being in a lounge, and being in a car, right? Where you lived. It is, but you're, you're used to it. It's not, you don't think about it. And you, you know, you're going for some, some purpose to see something or go see somebody to work on something interesting. It, it's, I miss it. I really miss it. Yeah. So if we could bring it back to entrepreneurship yeah. a little bit, yep. you bootstrapped Consult Edge, right? So now oh. everybody, everybody's dream is I'm going to start this. I'm going to get VC money and somebody big is going to buy me in 60 months or less. When you started that business, you had to do it very differently. Can you share what that was like? Yeah, absolutely. So I probably should, again, going back to where it's not for the faint of heart. So I had a very good job making a lot of money. And I remember we you know, just had our first kid, bought our first house, and I got a new truck. And I came home to tell my wife, hey, quitting my job. And she said, you know, what are you doing? I said, look, and I gave that whole same theory, 25%, the, the way it works. And she goes, eh, give my wife some credit. She goes, look, you're going to do what you're going to do. And I know you'll do it well. And go ahead. And it worked. I mean, to be fair, it was bootstrapped. You know, Frank and I, we put enough money in to make a couple of buys up front to uh, get equipment that we needed for, for sales. You know, we got lucky. We ran into a couple of large opportunities. You know, I think I remember we bought, um, it was an old Lehman's, Lehman Brothers Definity that they had. It, if you remember the old, scary, for those out there that know what a Definity is, you're, you're dating yourself. Three. Yeah. So we yeah. went out and bought all the equipment for, I remember it was uh, $110,000. So, you know, went to our bank and took cash out and we both split it and bought the system. We sold it for two ten dollars in a week. And that's where we said, oh, this could be pretty good. This might really work out the way we thought. Um, I ended up selling that company, if you remember, in about 14 months. So to your point of, you know, building, selling, it just happened to be the right time. You know, frankly, we were thinking about some different things. I ended up buying Frank out and it was kind of odd because I literally signed the documents to uh, close the, seal, the deal with Frank. And a week later, I sold the company to Alphanet. And the reason for that was to go run their division at a bigger company. Uh, looking at it, it's, look, it's a better opportunity for my company to grow within a larger entity, all of those things. And that's something I could tell you after doing that, I learned, should have weighed that out. It's not always what you think, right? You know, Is it are you better off raising capital and building? There's a lot of things that I didn't know, still being a little naive, first company. Yeah. Second company was different. So to your point, that was also bootstrapped and you know a little, I would say different than even uh, flagship, the first company, because it took 18 months to start making some money. I mean, you know, we, we joke about it. I think I made $17,000 in the first year. And yeah. how could that happen? But the reason for that was, started in 2000. I literally started the company right after the dot bomb. 
Yep. So it was a, it had to cause us to make some changes in our strategy where we were looking to become a quick, you know, lucent dealer at the time and all these other, you know, Cisco and other platforms, nobody was buying anyway. So for us, we, we changed our, if you look at the name consultage, we changed the whole meaning to consultative approach rather than coming and looking what you could do to buy. How do we help you do more with what you have, especially trying to conserve cash? It worked. And if you remember, I mean, you guys were, you know, integral in helping us with that because I think you were at, uh, what was it? Um, Westcon at the time. Yeah, I would say we just been acquired by Westcon. Yeah. Yeah. So it took us a bit of getting that rolling and getting it together. But, you know, we started to make some money and we got to the same point. And one of the things kind of going back to how I ended up even working with some of these uh, PE firms and some of the rest of it was I started looking at things like investments. And I will tell every entrepreneur how to talk about it. It's family. It is. I mean, the, the people, there's no separating that. Don't fall in love with the business, okay? It's business. And and I can tell you war stories from some of my friends that didn't sell their companies and end up costing them, in some cases, hundreds of hundreds millions. Of millions of dollars. Yeah, but yeah. this was a case that I looked at it like an investment. And when I finally said, look, I've been in this thing for nearly 10 years. Is this, I had partners, that's good and bad, right? You know, this is another lesson. You and I have talked about this often, you know, equity. Hey, equity helps track people. You don't get it back. Right, you don't feel equity until you sell an organization and realize that you know whoever has what's getting the same piece. So, and that's not a knock on anybody I've ever worked with. I mean, I had the best guys that I could have ever had partners in the company. Yeah. Love them, miss them. I still talk to them for friends. I miss them as partners. But you know, we took it as far as I thought to get what I wanted to make out of it. I started looking at it and said, I don't think I'm ever going to get it to that that never care again number. But we were able to work something out where it was enough to not have to ever worry again. So you kind of look at it and say, what was my options? And even thinking back, you know, I, if you look at the guys over at Carousel, right? Carousel just sold NWN. Yep. You know, hey, Jimmy and Jeff are great guys. Love them. Couldn't be any happier for them. Jeff did a lot of the same things that we could have done. Bought partners out, bought, you know, he recapitalized, done a lot of those things. And it's really, you know, the capital is what has probably changed for me more than anything over the years. Understanding how the money flows and works within the business, what you can do with it. You know, not that it was, it was never important, but, you know, bootstrap is a good thing to start. If you got a good idea, you know, go raise capital. I'm telling you. Uh, and I'll actually, you know, use a company that I'd worked with for a while as an example. And without going into all the names, so one company raised 16 million over 16 years. The other company that was the same startup with a lesser product raised 150. One sold for, you know, 20-ish. One was worth a billion in market cap. Yep. Can you figure out who was who? I mean, it, it, you know, money drives businesses. It helps you do all the things to drive revenue. At the end of the day, for me, look, you want a sound, solid business. That's a fact but you want to move quickly. You want to be aggressive. You want to be able to get the right people. It takes capital to do that. Yep. Yeah. So cash is king. Always. But we funny. We say that every day, you know, it's even worse than when your investors are reminding you cash is king. Like we, we know <laughs> it's like, we know. Yeah. We, we know we, we've been down that road. Actually funny. There was a book and I tell every entrepreneur should read this. It's called the six month fix. It was written by, and I got it somewhere behind me on the bookshelf, but the theory was a guy that goes in and does turnarounds, mm -hmm. but there's a couple things in there that are absolutely practical to, you know, everyday business. And the one that has always stuck with me, he said, look, if you can't take it to the store and buy bread with it or milk, it doesn't count. So I tell everybody, don't talk to me about your receivables. Don't talk to me about what we have coming. What do we have in cash? Where is the cash? Yeah, that's, that's what matters. It's what drives your business. Yeah. And I'm sure, Tim, yeah, I know you know it. We've talked about this often, right? Being in the world of distribution, the margins were always uh, coming for distribution. You're always talking about those, those razor thin margins, right? Yeah. You're so, dealing in basis points and you're dealing with terms. And you, the thing people don't understand about distribution that aren't in it, you're a bank. You're, you're, the product is just trading for money. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's definitely important, right? especially when your, your margins are thinner. I uh, said, so even going back to, you know, Consult Edge, when we were so, not again, not a knock, but we were selling Cisco, we we're selling Avaya. At Avaya, we were making 30 plus points. Yeah. Still, at Cisco, I was making single digits. So you're making mid singles. That's so when a customer owed me money for, you know, well, let's call it six months, I wasn't happy about it because, you know, 
we didn't give everybody six month terms. We know that. So we're waiting six months to get paid when it was a via, you know, I'm not happy about it, but the cost of money versus everything else, I can kind of live with it. If I had to, to get paid on yeah. Cisco, I'm upside down at that point. Yeah. So You're that, losing money. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest lesson that I, that I keep coming back to. It's, it's about cash, yeah. you know, have it, raise it, manage it, but don't be sloppy with it. Not that I, we ever were, but just don't no. get yourself in a lot of trouble. You know, the one thing I took away from Jack early on, right? I was, we had the money, we had the funding, he had amazing financial resources and I wanted to scale faster. He's like, would you rather be bigger and less profitable or smaller and make far more money? Right. And that's that when you're in your mid twenties trying to drive a business to hundred million dollars, that's a tough conversation to understand. I'm like, no, no, we're, we're going to be a hundred million dollars. He's like, yeah. And you're going to make X where you can be 80 million and you'll make Y. It's not worth it. So, now you look at it and you go, oh, I could have done it at 35 and it would have been amazing. Yeah. I was just going to say, and that's also, there's, there's a couple of theories on that too, as you know, right? You could say, well, I could be really profitable at a lower number and run it. But that's, again, that's the decision early on. Do you want to run it forever? Yeah. I mean, there are people, because because think about it. If you're building it to run it forever, you're going to run it forever. I mean, yep. it's, it's like almost self-fulfilling. But there's also the theory that says, you know, how much revenue can we buy? How how hot is the company? And what's the, the market for acquisition? What's multiple. Yeah. That's the multiple. Exactly. Because that's the other area. Right now, well, especially now with money, there's a lot of money out there. Right? You know, talk about COVID. A lot of money sat on the sidelines for a long time. I mean, you see everybody's talking about SPACs and the other things that are out there right now. There is a buyer for just about everything. Now, it may not be the terms you want or maybe more than you ever thought. But you, know, you have to kind of factor that in too. It's, uh, and again, to me, that's, that's the fun part. I think that's you know, where we live and I, I enjoy that. I mean, I really, to me, that's the, where I mentioned before, all those different stages, they all have different, uh, let's call it benefits to it. You know, when you start talking end stage, I mean, look, be, getting involved in the M&A side, I, I love it. I do. I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. we're sick. We think due diligence is fun. <laughs> you, you know what? It's, uh, well, I, I could tell for, for a different conversation, we can go through the stories of that. But, you know, there's, there's been a couple because you know when to play the game too. And, you know, when you get towards the end, it's, yeah, you don't want to jeopardize the opportunity, but it's also an opportunity to pull in another five, 10 points. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to do what you need to do to make that happen, right? And, you know, you, it's all part of the game. You know, it's, uh, how would you put it? There's two people sitting at the end of the table. One is to get the most for the company. The other is to pay as least as they can. And you're going to have to figure out a way to, you know, kind of slot it to you or, or whichever side of the table you're at. Yeah. And no matter which end you're at, you got to not be afraid to walk. You got to be able to walk. Otherwise you lose it. Nope. I mean, look, we, we've had it happen, right? We, we walked in a few deals at Consult Edge, you know, we had opportunities and offers that look, did we ultimately walk away from one that might've been better? Possibly. But there were a lot of things that we factored into it and you made the decisions that were best at that time for the organization. And like I said, the, the best choice for us may have been just to raise cap. I mean, you know, we had a great company, but at the same time, you know, using all the, where do I want to be in five, 10 years? Eh, you know what? You, you can't, it's hard to, it's always easy to look back. It's always easy to do what they call that Monday, Monday morning quarterback, but nah, we made a great decision. Everybody's ended up doing really well. The partners, the company, the people. Yeah. It really was, I think it was just good for everybody all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. So final question, sure. if you had to say one thing, what was your biggest success? Hmm. Are you talking business wise or personal? Or just, uh, you could do either, but I, I was thinking business, but personal certainly. You can I'd say do. my kids. I mean, look, one of the things that having a father that likes to tinker and, and is entrepreneurial and starts things, you're constantly in their ear, right? So you're, you know, you're always talking about them. My, my son ended up uh, going into the banking world. He loves it, loves finance, loves the deals, right? That's where he wanted to be. Uh, my daughter sadly wants to follow in my footsteps. So I say sadly. I that's like, brilliant, by the way. I, I, and you've, you've met my daughter, but, you know, I actually was no, talking no. to somebody about her today and said, well, what is she like? You know, I mean, she was a college athlete. She's, uh, you know, an aggressive kid. I said, she's me with discipline. At her age, she was me with discipline. I said, I still thought I knew more than everybody in the world and I was going to do it my way and all the rest of that. So that kind of tended more to the entrepreneurial side, right? Had to be my way. You know, Ali is somebody that, that fits in. You know, Nick, I, he, he's, like I said, he, he far surpassed what 
And I, I could have done because he, he had a plan and worked his plan. But I like to think that myself, my wife had a lot to do with, hey, do this. Don't do that. But make the mistake, right? We talked about it earlier. Make a mistake, learn. It's, uh, he, he was really good at that too. So yeah, I'm proud of both of them. Uh, so that's probably it. That out of all the, the mania of all these years that I wound up with, you know, two really solid two kids. kids. Yeah, two great yeah. kids. I'm happy about it. Yeah. And it's funny because in Allie, and I haven't talked to Nick in recent years, I can see both you and your wife right there in the conversation. Oh, yeah. thank God she looks like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> so she, she does, I, I guess, good and bad. She has my temperament. <laughs> you know, so, but so does Nick. They're, look, they're both sore losers. I'm going to tell you that right now. They're, they, they don't like to lose. They, they really are, um, they're not built for it. But actually, funny thing on that, I know we're kind of wrapping up, but you and I, and I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, some of the psychological stuff. And it, I, I'm what, 53 years old now. And sadly, I just learned this about myself and doing some reading and looking at things that what always draw, drove me, and I never really thought about it, was not so much the win. I mean, look, I love the win. Yeah. But I hate to lose more than I like the win. And I said, how, how is that? I, I never would have thought that would have been humanly possible. I started really diving into it and thinking about it. And it's true. I, losing, I, I just, I still don't deal well with it. 53, I hate it. And it could be this, it could be a deal for five bucks. And I'm just as mad as it was a million dollar deal. And people say, oh, it can't be. Go, no, yeah. it is. It Lose, is. Yeah, I'm not built for that. I'm just not. <laughs> <laughs> this, nah. it's so true, right? And you, you just can't change it. That's just oh. how, we, how you are. And I, I know what I'm like. I don't play games at home. I don't play board games with the family because... I get, I become that person. Tim, you, you, we talk about Nick, right? We still, my, my wife tells a story. Uh, oh my God. What's, what's the game? I gotta remember it now with, uh, you drop the tiles into the board and you get, Oh, five, uh, right? connect four, connect four, uh, five, I'm sorry, five row, connect four. So I, I used to destroy myself, not because I, I had any you know, desire. I mean, he's a little kid. He was five, four, five, six. I had to win. I had to, I couldn't let him win. But the day he beat me, I remember I saw it before he did. And I saw that little head come up on the other side of the board and the eyes went wide. The <laughs> fists went in the air and he was running around the house screaming. And my wife go, Ray's go, what, what is that? He go, ah, he beat me. Now, I have to admit, I was full of pride and wanted to smash the board at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah, it's funny, but it carried, look, they're both like that. It took them all the way through. Like my daughter doesn't like to play games with me because of that. Yeah, it's why I don't play, right? You, you get to know your limits, and it's like, yeah, I can either be dad or I can be me. I probably can't be both. So, well, like I said, your kid—I haven't seen Abby in a long time, but you know, Courtney, I've spoken with. Courtney's you. <laughs> She's got Courtney, a lot of Kelly, but Courtney's you. Abby's actually as much or more me with sort of the directness. Courtney has Kel's soul, right? Abby's Abby's kind of the ruthless young me. <laughs> that's not a bad thing look it, it, this this day and age it's a good thing you gotta have some drive yeah you do <laughs> neil thanks for being here no thanks for having me but it was, it was really fun love to do it again absolutely